Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. It is time for part five of our Nintendo Power Retrospective, and we've come to issue six of Nintendo Fun Club News. So, after this issue, there is only one issue remaining of Nintendo of the Fun Club newsletter until we finally get to the Nintendo Power that we come to know and love, and which is the iconic version, which we we, we all grew up with it. We've even if you didn't read it in this period and stuff, and as far as when it was the strategy guide era stuff, you've seen people talk about it, you've seen the angry video game nerd know about it, talk about it. You should theoretically have some knowledge of this if you're enough of a retro gaming fan to be watching this, and if you don't, well, that's okay. We will get to it in good time, and you will get to experience it the first for the first time through me. I'm not full of myself at all, am I? Anyway. This issue has only one game featured, and a whole bunch of articles on games that isn't out yet, so I'm going to fudge things and discuss an earlier installment in a series that, is, that gets discussed this issue. I'll get to that when I get to it. But in the meantime, let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Zelda II, The Adventure of Link. The art tries to be all serious and dramatic, but it doesn't quite work for me. I blame Link's nose. After an ad for Bases Loaded and our editorial, where they boast that the Fun Club has now reached one million members, we get to the magazine proper. Our first article is about Zelda 2. Previous issues have covered smaller aspects of the game, but this one puts everything all together. It isn't quite as good as the article about the game that we get later, which is when I'll actually talk about this game, but this article does run down the items in the game, what they do, along with the various spells in the game. We also get some very basic maps for the first three palaces, and some strategies for the first two bosses. We also get some previews of U.S. Golf, and Super Mario Bros. 2, which is now more clearly an, ad an adapted version of Doki Doki Panic. The U.S. Golf preview actually is a bit more something in depth, somewhat in depth, and then it gives pictures of all 18 holes on the course. So, to make up for the limited number of games this issue, I played U.S. Golf. This game is kind of a pain in the butt. As a whole, it controls well. Aiming is intuitive, and your swing involves the same sort of three-tap power gauge that most golf games use. You tap once to start your swing, tap again to set the power, and tap a third time as close as possible to the highlighted area to set your accuracy. All of this is really easy to learn. The problem, though, is club selection. Most golf games I played on the PC and later on on consoles would usually give you some sort of caddy option where you get a club recommendation that is the best for your current lie. For example, uh, one wood or driver when you're at the tee, uh, sand wedge when you're in a bunker, uh, pitching wedge or a nine iron when you're getting closer to the green, and various clubs in between based on where you are on the fairway. That sort of thing. This doesn't do that. You have to know what clubs are the right clubs for your lie on your own, and how much power you need for that lie with that club. On the one hand, that's the kind of information real golfers need to know in order to succeed. And speaking as someone who has played golf in the real world before, albeit badly, I kind of know this information on my own. On the other hand, requiring your players to have that information going in makes playing the game a little less approachable and accessible than it would be otherwise. You have to pick this up while you're playing, and that can be really daunting for a newcomer. And that's part of the reason why less people take up playing golf. That and the cost of clubs and going to a golf course and that. Anyway, yeah, it, it makes the game a bit of a pain to get into. Next, Louis Reviewee has a write-up of Double Dragon, with a description of the game's premise, enemies, and controls. What it doesn't have is a description of the game's leveling up mechanics, something that is kind of significant considering that the article describes the moves, but doesn't mention that 
you don't get all of these moves at the beginning. They're unlocked over time as you level up the main character by beating enemies. The article also includes some character art, which kind of plays up the fact that the characters are kind of out of fist of the North Star. Billy in particular, in his little portrait, looks a lot like Kenshiro. As it is, Double Dragon is the game that is responsible for popularizing the beat-em-up genre. Renegade introduced it, but Double Dragon refined it, with solid controls, an intuitive combat mechanic, difficulty that was reasonable, and ultimately, the only real problem this game has is related to a couple things. One, the leveling up mechanic. It, well, I mean, I like RPG systems in my games. I'm a big fan of RPGs. If you are watching these videos through my blog, you know that I've written a few little bits and pieces of RPG-related material there. And still, though, I like my RPGs when they have some meaning to the mechanics, when there's a sense of choice, either in terms of decisions about how the game unfolds, or some choice in terms of your character mechanics, in terms of what abilities you learn, or what weapons you equip, or something. But here, there's no real choice. You get your level, you get your new moves when you level up, you don't gain more hit points when you level up, your hit point gauge doesn't refill when you level up, you have no choice in paths through the game, you just gain levels when you beat up enough dudes, and that's it. The second is the game involves platforming, starting in the third level, and it, but it's executed poorly, requiring the player hold down the A and B buttons at the same time, as opposed to having a dedicated jump button, and that's just clunky. Honestly, I'd rather they have, if they're going to do platforming at all, they do it in a fashion where you have like one dedicated attack button and one dedicated jump button. Make it simple, make it straightforward, something other than what they did here. For Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, we have strategies for fighting Super Macho Man and Iron Mike himself, as well as ways to stop Bald Bull's charge. There also are some tips for quickly recharging your energy gauge in Metroid, and some strategies for beating Ridley. For Super Mario Bros., we get the Continue Code, along with a glitch that can be exploited on 2-4, and presumably later castles that use the same layout, to let you run along on the ceiling rather than have to run through the bottom and potentially end up getting, oh, killed by flaming breath from Bowser or other nasty things. We get a selection of user reviews and high score submissions and user submitted tricks and all that sort of thing. The letters column also has more requests for tricks, including one long sob story from a spouse whose husband is stuck on The Legend of Zelda and who gets a recommendation that she buy the strategy guide from Nintendo. Way to go for the marketing there. Finally, we get the winners of the Metroid Art Contest, and there's some good stuff here. One particularly nice piece of art is from a guy named Scott Clark. Now, that name is moderately common, but there is a comic book artist named Scott Clark, and I kind of sent him a message on DeviantArt, because he's got a DeviantArt account, asking him if this art piece of art is by him. Well, if I hear back from him, and it's a positive or whatever, I will let you know what the response is. Anyway, this issue wraps up with our usual puzzle play page. As far as my pick for this issue goes, I went with Double Dragon all the way. Yes, Double Dragon isn't without its issues, but it's fun. It's got some replay value. It's got a two-player mode, which is also always really nice. And yep, Golf has it does two-player as well. But I feel that the two-player in Double Dragon has sort of a different feel to it um, and works a little better for playing it with somebody next to you on the couch. So they're both pretty fun, and, but it's really fun, definitely worth picking up. It is unfortunately not available on the Virtual Console, so you're going to have to get a cartridge of this. From here on, when I give my picks, I will talk about whether or not they're on the Wii Virtual Console. Um, anyway. Next week, though, it's time for the book review. And I'm finally going to get around to one of the series that I've been reviewing stuff in before and getting the next installment of it. No, not the Elenium, though I will get to that too in good time. I'm talking about Cities in Flight. We're going to do part two of Cities in Flight, A Life for the, for the Stars. So, I'll see you then, and thank you for watching.